Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, Defender of Wildlife's uh, Lunch and Learn webinar. Uh, I am Greg McNamara, based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm a Defenders member uh, and became a volunteer after attending last year's uh, Red Wolf Lunch and Learn webinar. <clears throat> Uh, the presentation is likely going to take the entire hour, so if you have any questions or comments along the way, please uh, post them to the Q&A feature, uh, and we'll do our best to answer them as we go on. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will open the floor for any questions or comments that you have. Um, so Lunch and Learn is an educational series offered by uh, the Defender Southeast Field Team to bring you up to speed on current projects uh, and to let you know how you can help. Um, our next one will be Wednesday, March 15th. Uh, and we're gonna feature our work to protect the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge from a proposed titanium mine. Um, a public comment period on this project uh, is gonna close on March 19th. And we'll be giving you the uh, information and tools you need to submit the comments if you haven't already. Um, but today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, a program we've been working on for uh, decades, uh, and this is the protection and recovery of the critically endangered uh, American red wolf. Um, there have been so many positive outcomes uh, that have occurred since our last red wolf webinar uh, and, and when I got involved, and we're excited to share them with you today. Um, but before we get into all of that, we are going to launch a poll so please uh, make sure that you participate. Uh, and here we go. We're curious to know if you attended last year's uh, Red Wolf webinar, or did you watch the recording? And how familiar are you with the plight of the Red Wolf? Wow, we have a lot of new joiners. So this is excellent. Um, and we are very excited to, to spread the message and all the great updates that we have. Fantastic. Okay. Well, why don't we get into it then? So um, joining me today are three members of our Southeast team, Heather Clarkson, our outreach representative based in Liberty, North Carolina. Uh, we've got Ben Prater, our Southeast program director based in Asheville, North Carolina, and uh, Tracy Davids, our Southeast senior representative also based in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, we also have a special guest today, Dr. Jesse Williams, uh, who is based in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, so now I'm going to turn the show over to Tracy. Uh, she's going to tell you a little bit, a little bit about Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, Tracy has been a member of this field team for the past eight years. Um, she advances the Southeast Field Conservation Program, uh, really with an emphasis on uh, the Southern Appalachian region. Uh, develops conservation objectives and strategies mm -hmm. and collaborates with partners to protect and restore uh, the region's imperiled wildlife and their habitats. So Tracy, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg. Um, welcome everybody. <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here today. I'm just gonna give you a little bit of information about Defenders of Wildlife because even if you've been a member for a while, I think it bears repeating. Um, we are a national nonprofit organization that's been around for about 75 years, and our mission is to protect all native animals and plants in their natural communities. And our approach to this mission is direct and straightforward. Uh, we work on the ground, in the courts, and on Capitol Hill <clears throat> to protect and recover species all over the continent. And our on the ground work is really the focus of our field conservation program. We have six field conservation programs or offices across the United States um, in Alaska, California, Rockies and Plains, Southwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, and here in the Southeast. And there's an excellent reason that we are based here in the Southeast. And that's because we have mega biological diversity. And as you can see from this map, we have very few protected areas. Uh, those are the areas in green. 
And so with a growing human population and very small parcels of public land, um, biodiversity protection is really important. Um, so the Southeast, we have broken up into um, some focal areas so that we can really um, help to prioritize where our work is happening. The first is in the Southern Appalachian region, and this is a global hotspot for amphibians and freshwater fish. Then we have the Carolina coast, which of course is home to the critically endangered red wolf. Then there's the greater Everglades, home to Florida panthers, manatees, and so many other species. And of course, the Florida panhandle, home to gopher tortoises and sea turtles. And finally, the Gulf Coast, home to biodiversity hotspots like the Mobile Tensaw River Delta and the Gulf of Mexico whale. <clears throat> and today, this is the area in which we will be uh, focusing. So from the ancient Appalachian Mountains to the longleaf pine savannas of the coastal plain to the river of grass we call the Everglades and the windswept dunes of our coasts, this is the Southeast that we call home and that we work very hard to protect. And now to tell us a little bit about uh, some recent updates with regard to the Red Wolf program is Ben Prater, who is our Southeast Program Director. Uh, ben is a career conservationist who for the past eight years has led our field team in our work to protect rare, threatened and endangered species through public outreach, advocacy, and the application of science, law, and policy for the conservation of biodiversity. Ben, take it away. Thank you, Tracy. Well, I'm sure as many of you know, Defenders has been at the forefront of legal advocacy for the protection and recovery of red wolves for almost a decade. Uh, we've obviously been involved for, for more than that, but our most recent uh, Round litigation has been really moving forward over the last decade or so. Uh, and during that time, we've actually been extremely successful at holding both state and federal agencies accountable to the Endangered Species Act and the public they serve. Our most recent court battle directly resulted in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service finally getting back on track with recovering the wild population of red wolves in North Carolina. And so we're finally seeing wild releases, pup fostering, breeding, all occurring. In fact, just over a year ago, and you'll learn more about this soon, uh, we had the first litter of wild red wolf pups born since 2018. And right now, as we speak, the Fish and Wildlife Service is undergoing another round of pairing and releases to continue to build back this beleaguered population. We are very encouraged by this, but we have a lot of ground to make back up to really reach that sustainable population level to have a thriving population on the ground again. But having the agency responsible for this effort once again fully committed to recovery in the wild is critical, and it's a major sea change that we've been able to instigate. Now, because this litigation that stimulated this shift is still open, I can't offer too many particulars, but I will share that we have been engaged in settlement negotiations, and we have made considerable progress in securing a better future for red wolves in North Carolina. And I'm hopeful that we'll have uh, more great news to share and celebrate soon. So Tracy, if you could advance the slide, I'd like to talk now about uh, recovery planning. Um, <clears throat> and I want to talk briefly about what recovery really looks like for red wolves. Now remember, red wolves are a southeastern native with a massive historical range. So while their current wild population exists only in North Carolina, it is not the end goal of the program, nor will this be a single population to help us meet our obligation under the law to recover red wolves fully to their historic range. Now, this is, of course, not to say that North Carolina is not essential uh, to a successful recovery program. I'm simply encouraging all of us today to think big when we're imagining what recovery really looks like. And this is where the recovery plan comes in. Uh, just last year, a new draft recovery plan was published and we expect it to be finalized by the end of this month. And I wanna draw your attention to the vision and strategy that's laid out in this plan. I think it's really uh, something that's sort of a, a good North Star for all of us to keep in mind. Uh, and so these are direct quotes from that plan as it's drafted. 
So a recovery vision is a description of the state of the species in terms of resiliency, redundancy, and representation. And rec when recovery has been achieved and protections under the act are no longer needed. Now, the vision for red wolves is that in the future, wild and free red wolves will coexist with humans in multiple viable populations across the historic range, where ongoing threats are effectively ameliorated through conservation activities and the public's trust and engagement uh, and aligned policies among stakeholders. So that's the vision. Uh, the strategy, sort of the how we get there, uh, is that for Red Wolf focus on improving resiliency and redundancy and maintaining representation, again, to meet the species needs for viability. And specifically, that strategy is going to seek to expand the distribution of the species in the wild, increase population abundance, and main, maintain gene diversity long term, and implement collaborative conservation to address species threats, as well as societal values related to the Red Wolf recovery effort. So, as you can see, the goal is for multiple populations of wolves that can thrive and coexist with people. And this is a vision, of course, we share at Defenders and have been working actively to promote for as long as we've been a part of this uh, effort to recover red wolves. So now I'm going to turn it over to Heather to talk more about that. Uh, and Heather, among other things, has been responsible for leading red wolf advocacy efforts. And she works with local communities, landowners, as well as state and federal lawmakers and regulators to promote and support the red wolf recovery program in eastern North Carolina. So Heather, take it away. All right. Thanks, Ben. So, oop. <laughs> all right. So the first thing we have going on um, is a second poll question. And this actually, we're not going to throw up um, the poll for you. We're going to ask you to please use the chat function. And in the chat, tell us how you first became interested in red wolves and what age were you when you first became interested in them? Um, I'm going to give you guys a few seconds to to uh, answer that in the chat before we move to the next slide. But I can tell you personally, um, I learned about red wolves when I was around seven years old as an elementary school student in the state of North Carolina. Um, I was obsessed with wolves. I thought I was a wolf. They were the coolest things in the world. Um, and I also thought it was super, super awesome that North Carolina was was home to this species. Um, and, and, you know, that was back in the 90s. Things have changed. But I got hired in 2016 full circle to come back and work on a species that meant so much to me as a child. And I just, I can't tell you how fulfilling that is. Um, all right. So you guys, it looks like I see some answers trickling in. Thank you very much. We're going to go ahead, um, move on to the next slide. And um, while you guys are all putting your answers in the chat, let's take a moment to listen to the most beautiful song in the world. The song of a deeply devoted family just trying to survive on a difficult and dangerous landscape. In this video, you're gonna hear what we call a rally or the family's call to assemble. All right, Tracy, I think we can press pause on that. Excellent. That was pretty special, wasn't it? Um, I, I especially like how you can hear different wildlife in that video. Um, and I want to just shout out a, a, a big thanks to Walt Jenkins, um, who was a Red Wolf uh, advocate and, and allowed us to show you guys that video because it is 
very, very special. Um, all right. Well, let's move on. Um, one last real quick, all oh, before we really get into the nitty gritty, I wanted to throw up this uh, photo of last year's six red wolf puppies. Um, those are the six puppies that were born in the recovery area, and they were the first puppies born there since 2018. Um, that was a, a huge moment for us as advocates for this species. So we can skip forward to the next slide. All right, so let's talk about some updates to the North Carolina wildlife, um, the wild population of red wolves. The current known population of wild adult red wolves in eastern North Carolina is 10. However, the estimated total population is around 19 to 21 wolves at this time. Um, all of the collared red wolves have special orange collars that I'll mention um, a couple slides from now. As of January, four of the six red wolf pups that were born um, on Alligator River Wildlife Refuge are known to have survived. Uh, video posted online does suggest that the fifth pup is still alive, um, but it's not been confirmed. And we do know, unfortunately, there was one known mortality of one of those six puppies due to a vehicle strike back in October. That puppy was also a female. We did reach out to the agency for a population update since January. However, they did not have any new information to provide, and we expect a new report either in April or May. All of the known monitored red wolves are using their expected area, um, with the exception of one young adult who's around two years old. It's a female, and she has been... Um, She's begun to very appropriately disperse from her family group and begin to look for her own territory in a mate. This is actually really cool, good news. Um, this female was actually captive born and fostered into a wild litter. Um, and just recently, you know, Fish and Wildlife confirmed that she's traveled over 30 air miles at one point looking for a new territory in a mate. Um, Fish and Wildlife is tracking her location closely to see where she settles down and who she settles down with. In addition to those wolves, there are multiple wolves in acclimation pens in the recovery area. Those wolves are a mixture of captive born and wild caught wolves and special pens are constructed in the recovery area to hold wolves while they bond throughout breeding season. Once they're bonded, the wolves are then released together with what's called a soft release Basically, they turn the electricity off and they allow the wolves to escape the pens together. Um, and those wolves are not counted in the total recovery area population until they're actually released. So we can move to the next slide. All right, so as far as on the ground management goes, um, as Ben mentioned, one of the results of our legal advocacy with Fish and Wildlife was that we have gotten them to commit to make to commit to making progress on not only releasing wolves in the wild, but also implementing what we call adaptive management strategies. And those adaptive management strategies are um, designed to combat issues like coyote hybridization. Um, at this time, there are 23 sterilized and collared coyotes on the landscape. Coyote sterilization is a critical management tool as a sterilized coyote becomes what we call a placeholder animal on the landscape. That individual holds territory and prevents new coyotes from moving in. However, that animal cannot reproduce, which is the important part. Additionally, more than 40 remote cameras have been deployed by Fish and Wildlife to monitor wolves and other wildlife that are using the recovery area, um, in addition to the telemetry monitoring and everything else that um, Fish and Wildlife is doing with their collars. One new concern that we have seen in the recovery area is increasing human presence. Um, and unfortunately, that causes wildlife to become habitualized to the noise and the smells that are associated with humans and vehicles. The service and partners are working to combat this new issue and ensure that the popularity of the wolves in the recovery area does not unfortunately spell further disaster, disaster for their recovery. Um, and then finally, you'll notice on this wolf, um, and I'm gonna shout out to David Bush for sharing that photo with us. Um, he's another local photographer. But you'll notice the large orange tracking collar on that wolf. All of the collared wild wolves in the recovery area are now wearing bright orange collars in the hopes that this will prevent misidentification. Um, these collars do not impact the wolf in any way, despite how large they are. And then um, also going back to you know, those 23 sterilized coyotes, they're wearing collars, but their collars are black. 
All right, so as far as recovery area community engagement and our work on coexistence, um, a new program that Defenders is gonna begin offering in 2023 20, um, is in-person workshops on non-lethal management for wildlife conflicts. We are gonna focus on meeting with local members of the community in small groups and provide them with education and resources as well as hands-on training for using different non-lethal techniques to solve wildlife conflict. You can skip ahead to the next slide. Last year, we altered our billboard designs. Um, our billboards used to be focused on more on ecotourism. Last year, we altered our billboard designs to focus more on road safety and build on that concept of wolves and family. It was really sad to lose the promise of a wolf pop, especially a female pop. Um, and each vehicle calls death for this species is really a huge blow to the recovery process. The new billboards not only encourage people to slow down and watch for wildlife, but it, it also encourages them to just respect the concept of the family, the wolf family, in the same way that we respect our own. Um, also, they're really pretty. And thanks to uh, Jesse for taking that photo. We can skip ahead. So in addition to that, we are also currently working on a new mini site, which is gonna provide a web-based toolkit for folks in the Southeast who are experiencing conflict or challenges with wildlife. This site is gonna include resources on wildlife identification and management options for dealing with these conflicts using non-lethal strategies. This is not only gonna focus on imperiled species like the red wolf and the Florida panther, which I, you guys can see on the screen, um, it's going to actually cover all of our usual suspects for wildlife conflict in the southeast, like weasels and raccoons, black bears, and more. And then finally, we've recently begun to work with the United, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Dare County, which is um, where a portion of the recovery area is in North Carolina, to find solutions for concerns around the landfill which abuts Alligator River Wildlife Refuge. Um, the landfill has long been a source of tension with wildlife in the area as bears and wolves and many other species understand that the landfill is an easy source of food. Unfortunately, that creates huge problems with animals then associating the sense of, of humans with food. And we all know that saying, you know, fed wildlife is dead wildlife. We're trying to avoid that. Um, Defenders actually has years of experience out in the West working with local governments to fence out grizzly bears and other species with similar problems. And we're intent, we intend to work with our partners in the West as well as Dare County to figure out what type of fencing situation is most appropriate for this landfill and help them construct it. That way we can keep bears and wolves and other wildlife from accessing the trash there. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Jesse Williams to tell us about some of the upcoming events that Defenders of Wildlife is planning. Jesse is a behavioral scientist who has been engaged in wildlife conservation for much of her life. She is a founding board member of Rare Species Conservatory Foundation, an organization that has played an important role in the conservation of African mountain bongo antelopes, among other species. And she currently holds, I mean, she currently serves on the board of directors at the Lemur Conservation Foundation as well. She has turned her attention more recently to red wolves. She even moved to North Carolina just to help us save red wolves. And she has become a red wolf ambassador for the Defenders of Wildlife. So Jesse, why don't you tell us about some of our upcoming events that we're working hard on? Thanks. Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you about a few events uh, that Defenders is um, supporting in North Carolina. And it's super important because most people really don't know about red wolves. And I think to save red wolves, we're gonna to have to know about them. So we're really trying to create fun and informative events. Uh, the first of these is actually falls on Endangered Species Day, May 20th, 2023. And so an observance of and celebration of Endangered Species Day, we will be hosting a social event aimed at red wolf awareness, education, and fundraising in Charlotte, North Carolina. So there'll be music, a silent auction, prizes, and red wolf ambassadors attending the event. And more details will come up as that evolves. The second event I wanna tell you about is on June 4th, 
And that's from um, one to five. And that's going to be at the Red Oak Brewery. Um, and it's not far outside of Greensboro in Wetsit. I may be saying that wrong because I'm still not a North Carolinian yet. Wetsit, North Carolina. Um, so that should be a lot of fun. This is an outdoor event sponsored by the Red Oak Brewery in conjunction with Defenders of Wildlife. And the event was created to raise awareness about American Red Wolf and especially make it known that this species is the only wolf indigenous to the United States and only lives in the wild right here in North Carolina. So people can know what a important um, role North Carolina will play in saving this precious species. So this is a free outdoor event at the brewery where you can enjoy live music, food trucks, local artists, and regional food vendors as you learn about this important species and the recovery efforts underway. Uh, the third event I want to tell you about will be in October, October 21st uh, from 1 to 5. And this event's going to be at the beautiful Carolina Theater in Greensboro. Um, it's a gorgeous venue for a uh, meeting, a uh, newly restored historic building. And uh, the event was created to raise awareness about the Red Wolf um, and includes short documentaries on Red Wolves, live music performance on stage. And we're hoping to get some original compositions to play to you as we pair that with a background of beautiful visual imagery of red wolves. We'll have some original poetry created and read on stage that day. And also include a presentation by one of the Defender uh, staff members that'll help folks understand all about this, this uh, effort and this wolf. So those are the events scheduled thus far. I'm sure there'll be more later. But that's it. So I'll hand it back to Greg. Thanks, Jesse. And uh, as you all can tell, we, we have a really exciting 2023 coming up um, for all of us that are involved or want to be involved um, in the recovery of the species. So um, before we, we officially close out the agenda, um, we do have another poll. Um, did you learn something new? about Red Wolves or our program today? Hopefully the answer is yes, but I'm not gonna lead the witness. All right. <laughs> well, you know, that is the goal, right? That is why we hold these, um, these lunch and learns and why we have these different, um, you know, educational sessions. Um, th this is constantly evolving. Obviously, there has been a ton of activity even in the last year. Um, so we are glad that 99% um, of you at least learned something new today. And even if you didn't learn anything new, it's always worth uh, hearing the repeat. Um, so I wanna you know, talk to you about how can you help? Um, this is something that is near and dear to me um, because you know I myself um, I am a volunteer, um, but I wanted to get involved and I wanted to do more than, um, you know, just writing a, a representative, uh, you know, how can I get more directly involved? And so there are a number of ways um, that, you know, we would like to suggest and, and provide options. So um, how you can help um, spread awareness of the plight of the red wolf and our predator resistant enclosure program uh, to friends and family. Um, volunteer with our red wolf program. Um, if you are interested, please send an email. Um, we can give, uh, we can provide you an email at the end of this call um, that you can reach out to, and we can see uh, how we can get you more directly involved. Um, drive the speed limit when visiting Red Wolf Country and watch for wolves. This is a big one. Um, you know, you heard earlier that there are mortality um, you know, due to um, due to cars in the recovery area. There are signs out there, but it's also, especially at night and early in the morning, it's very dark. Um, and so it, it is a thing. Um, join the Defenders of Wildlife National and Red Wolf Facebook groups and other social media 
uh, to engage in actions to protect red wolves and other uh, imperiled species. Uh, join the efforts to safeguard the Endangered Species Act and other bedrock legislation. Be informed about new opportunities to protect red wolves by signing up for uh, Defenders Action Alerts and visiting uh, our website. Um, share action items on social media. Um, support the Red Wolf Program by visiting a special, or excuse me, a Species Survival Program Zoo Facility or SSP um, and attend one of our upcoming events. Uh, as you saw, there's quite a bit in 2023. There will probably be even more um, that we plan beyond this meeting. So, um, Tracy, Heather, I um, guess I could turn it back to you. Do we have anything that we want to take care of within the Q&A? Actually, this is the perfect time to just open it up to questions. Um, and there's always a ton of questions, which is we try to leave time at the end for that. Um, Ben and I have been trying to tackle the questions in the chat and the QA, Q and A as fast as possible, though the chat ones are coming in almost too fast for me to keep up with. So I'm going to go ahead and just open it up um, and we'll popcorn style jump in. Um, we can even stop the PowerPoint if, if that's good for everyone, or we can leave it up and you can write our email addresses down. Um, but actually, I'm going to go ahead and go through the chat and see if I can answer some questions, guys. Um, so looking through here. Um, uh, Steve Gilbert did ask, um, Steve's an old colleague from South Carolina. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you're here, Steve. Uh, Steve actually asked, for those of you guys who haven't seen um, the answer in the chat, Steve asked about wildlife crossings. Um, when we're talking about vehicular mortality, obviously wildlife crossings are um, a big deal and really helpful. Unfortunately, they're also incredibly expensive. And um, my, my, my head explodes when I try to sit into any explanation of what it has to go into planning a wildlife crossing, whether it's an underpass or an overpass um, or et cetera. Uh, the good news is, though, there is actually one wildlife crossing on Highway 64 already, um, and it gets used pretty frequently. Um, the wildlife love it. And we've been um, discussing with partners and NCDOT about um, installing more. Again, they are massive projects, and anyone who works with roads and road building um, unfortunately knows that these types of projects are usually, they take decades to plan. And, and implement. Um, so yes, that we are, we are really hoping to see more crossings. Um, however, we cannot put all of our eggs in that basket and things have to be done well before, you know, those are actually uh, installed. Thanks, Heather. Um, I'd also like to comment briefly on the issue of wildlife connectivity, crossing structures, uh, mitigation, vehicle collision work as well. Um, I am very pleased to announce, and I know most of you may know about this, but the bipartisan infrastructure uh, bill that was passed uh, in the last Congress has for the first time uh, provided and stood up a significant amount of federal funding to go directly towards this issue. Uh, both increasing connectivity for terrestrial and aquatic wildlife, uh, repairing and improving our infrastructure in a way that allows for permeability of species to move through their natural habitats. And to bring that focus here back in North Carolina, uh, Tracy and I in particular, as well as Heather, have been working on um, efforts across the state uh, to support appropriations, legislative appropriations that will allow um, our state organizations like the North Carolina DOT and the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission to help be competitive for some of these federal grant programs that help subsidize, as Heather points out, rightfully so, these really steep cost projects. Um, and the great news is we now have those funds. Uh, and if, when we get, if and when we get those funds through a grant program or legislation, et cetera, uh, it's a really amazing once a generation opportunity to repair some of the problems we created with our transportation system. So I'm very excited about that opportunity in North Carolina. I saw someone else mention about the work in Florida. Well, in case you didn't know, we're doing that work too. Um, that's where we actually model a lot of our successful efforts um, from our experience in Florida into North Carolina and other southeastern states. So 
Wildlife connectivity, crossings, and wildlife vehicle collisions are going to continue to be a major focus for defenders of wildlife in the future. And one last note, I'm, oh, I sorry, Tracy. Um, I, Megan asked in the chat to us if we could tell her exactly where the crossing is. Um, and Megan, I'm gonna have to get you to, to email us because I don't, I can't tell you off the top of my head where exactly it is, but I can get that information for you. Um, and I'm gonna have to go look up your Red Wolf article. Um, I'm just going through the chat. Oh, yeah. sorry, Tracy, go and, ahead. Yeah, while you do that, I'll just add on to what Ben mentioned in terms of funding for crossings. Um, we just, you know, last week asked Governor Cooper in North Carolina um, to appropriate $10 million um, in the new fiscal year budget to support wildlife crossings across the state. Um, so we're hoping that when the draft budget comes out in March, it will include that and the federal match is nine to one. So if we can put up 10 million, um, we should be able to get um, nine times that in a federal match. That's really cool. Good news. All right. Um, ben, I'm going to let you answer this one. So Sarah has asked about um, the map. We showed the historical range map early sure, on. Sure, sure, sure. And she's specifically asking about that red area and how Louisiana and Texas fits into this. Very exciting. So uh, I'll, I'll please catch me on an individual conversation because I can talk about this for hours and I'll spare you that at the moment. But um, so that indicates on the map that you saw is actually what we call the source population for red wolves. So. Um, as with many of our predator species, we really um, uh, destroyed the resource, the habitat, the populations uh, during westward expansion, colonialism, et cetera, et cetera. We all know the history of wildlife abuses in the U.S., uh, and our predators were some of the ones to suffer the greatest losses. So the red wolf used to range, as you saw in that map, that orange area, over a vast stretch of the southeast, covering a huge range of, and variety of habitats. Um, but all the way into the 50s and 60s, people really started to recognize how rare these animals were. And actually very little was known about their ecology. Uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service took very bold action uh, in, in the 60s and 70s to uh, rescue uh, this species from the brink of extinction. They saw the restriction of the range. They saw the rarity of the animals. They hardly saw them or heard them anymore. And that sort of south uh, Western Louisiana, southeastern Texas was an area where the swamplands of that area were the spot where they were able to actually um, bring red wolves out of the wild. They captured a ton of, of canids in the area and were able to then, uh, through uh, the science at the time, designate 14 individuals that end up becoming the founding population for the current red wolf um, population, in both captivity and the wild. Um, now, interestingly enough, so that was really kind of the birthplace of red wolf recovery in the modern age. Now, interestingly enough, fast forward to the last three or four years, uh, we've actually rediscovered red wolf DNA in that same location. So what that tells us is a few things. Number one, red wolves, at least their genes, are still extant on the wild landscape. Now, that gets very interesting when you're talking about policy and the Endangered Species Act. So what are these animals? Well, that's what we're working to, 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 to figure out. So what we what this also shows us is that the uh, red wolves and their genes have the capacity to survive a significant amount of, of human pressure on their population and do so in the presence of coyotes, which is often seen as sort of an ex existential threat for the ability of the red wolf population to thrive. Um, what we actually know is that it's human persecution that creates the mechanisms that facilitate that interbreeding and hybridization. So if we can, again, reduce the amount of uh, mortality for adult breeding animals, the likelihood of coyotes and red wolves uh, pairing and breeding is, 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 is diminished because they are naturally um, inclined to not pair up uh, as they're completely different species, but closely related cousins, if you will. Uh, so yeah, that map tells us a lot, not only about the history of this recovery program, but perhaps even the future of the recovery program, as we again have rediscovered these red wolf genes, uh, lots of fascinating scientific questions, lots of um, sort of uh, interesting policy questions, but nonetheless, I really want to stress that what this really demonstrates 
is just how resilient nature is, how adaptable uh, canines and wolves are, and really helped to remind us anytime, especially over the last few years for red wolves, that we've sort of seen things get really bad. Uh, there is hope. Uh, one of the wonderful things about red wolves is they don't need a lot of help from us if we just create the space and the opportunity for them to thrive. And that's what we're focused on at Defenders. And we really appreciate everyone's support uh, in learning more about how you can help that effort as well. Thank you, Ben. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move right on. I see a couple of people are are asking questions about captive born wolves and source population as far as that goes and then how wolves are released in genetic um, swapping. So let me um, really quickly touch on that subject. So it's a really good question. Basically, we have a um, we have a population, a, a decently healthy, robust population of red wolves in captivity. So those wolves are scattered around the country um, in different facilities that have been a part of this program for a very, very long time. And those facilities' main job is to take care of these wolves and, if possible, help them reproduce and produce more, um, more wolves. Every one of those wolves is legally owned by the Fish and Wildlife Service, by the federal government. They are all kept in very particular um, types of pens. Uh, many of them are kept off site, which means like they, they I mean, um, they can't be viewed by visitors. Again, that goes back to preventing acclimation to, to humans and stuff like that. Um, however, I will say from what we've seen, it is really the success rate of, of releasing a, a adult wolf from a captive facility into the recovery area is low. We could all probably guess why it's really low. Those wolves are not, they don't grow up in the wild. They haven't been taught what to avoid and how to hunt and how to act. Um, also, they're acclimated to humans, whether we've we've tried really hard or, um, to keep it from happening, it's, it still happens. So what's really cool though, is we talked in the presentation a little bit about um, puppy fostering. And what that means is essentially, if Fish and Wildlife identifies a wild born litter of puppies um, in the recovery area, and there is also a captive born litter of red wolf puppies. And they're right around the same age, very, very close. And that, that's how it usually happens because um, their cycles and reproductive and all that does, it all happens at the same time. Um, they will take those captive puppies and sneak them into the wild litter. Sometimes they'll just kind of sneak in a couple and make a small litter, a bigger litter. And then those captive born wolves are being raised by wild wolves and um, you know, they're, they're already on the landscape. You don't have to worry about releasing them, they're there. Also, they're completely genetically diverse, probably from the wolves that they're being raised along with. Um, also, they can do this with hybrid litters. So they, they can even go in if they know whether or not a litter is, is all red wolf or not, they can still, slide in these purebred pure red wolf puppies um, and let them be raised by even a wolf and a coyote pair. Um, it's, it's just a, a strategy that's available to the service. Um, and it is a strategy that is working really, really, really well. Um, like I mentioned, that, that female who's dispersing um, and looking for a mate in a new territory was actually, actually captive born and fostered into a wild litter. Um, Another way that the captive wolves are used to provide genetic diversity and then also um, create a more robust population in the recovery area is through what we call propagation sites. Um, these, there's only like one being used now that I'm aware of, um, which is St. Vincent Island in Florida. And this is actually another national wildlife refuge, but it is an island. It is not connected to the mainland. And there is, a, there is a, a small family group of red wolves on that propagation island. And what that allows the service to do is take juveniles or even adults from captive facilities and put them on this propagation island and let them learn how to be wolves in a safe environment um, where you know vehicle mortality can be more controlled, where acclimation with humans could be more controlled. Um, it's not perfect. It's, I think it still took them two or three years to catch one of the females on that island because um, she was too smart. But um, they got her this year. They did get and her. So they she's bringing those her. wily genes to North Carolina. Yeah. So look out. But 
I'm thrilled because it took them that long to catch her that like, you know, she's a spicy little lady um, and she's going <laughs> to give that to, to her children. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but that's, I, I hope that answers a couple of the questions I've seen about how the population flows between wild and captive populations of wolves and how we're using the captive wolves to, um, to make genetic diversity and litter sizes and all of that more robust um, in the recovery area. Yeah, thank you, Heather. I'm going to jump in and try to add a little bit to that and and and, the, and sleep up some of the other questions that have come in that are related to it. Um, so, first, let me share that there's a question about you know how many years will Fish and Wildlife Service be releasing wolves. Um, the intent is to have Fish and Wildlife Service develop, which they have for the past three seasons now, the third one being this, this, this uh, winter uh, and spring, moving into the breeding and, and uh, whelping seasons, uh, reducing release plans uh, each year in cooperation with conservation partners, mainly the um, safe program facilities, the safe animals from extinction, uh, American zoos and aquarium certified facilities that breed uh, red wolves and provide the population available for release. Um, so through close coordination, timing, uh, as well as folks at the propagation side. So it's a it's a pretty big logistical effort. But the good news is, is that Fish and Wildlife Service is committed and, can, and being consistent with that. And we imagine it's going to continue into the future. Uh, we hope that with the recovery plan and the related population viability analysis, forgive all the jargon, but uh, that will give us an idea of the number of releases that are needed year to year to both sustain and grow a population in the face of um, you know, known uh, incidents of mortality. So uh, again, our intention is to make sure these releases continue to occur uh, because they're vital to sustaining and building a population uh, to a level that can, again, sustain itself. That's the self-sustaining part. That's the goal of the recovery. Um, I also want to quickly talk about, there's been a lot of questions about uh, poaching and killing of wolves. And you're absolutely right. You know, that, the incidents of poaching are very, um, they're, quite frankly, they're uncommon. They're extremely rare. Um, and so I don't want folks to get caught up in the hyperbole that, you know, everyone is out to get the red wolves. That's simply just not true. Uh, the fact of the matter is you have a crisis of such a few number of wolves that any malicious incident like that has a really deleterious effect on the population. So I don't want to dismiss poaching as a threat because it absolutely is, but it's a very, very wicked problem because everything it requires to address requires someone's moral compass to not be completely destroyed. I personally have no idea what would drive someone to poach a wild creature like this. And I have a really tough time when we're talking about you know, human uh, interaction and social tolerance to sort of get past that like just mental block. But I'm working through it. I'm working on it. Um, not that I would engage that poaching is something that's necessary, but just you know, there's a reason why people are driven to do those those criminal things. And understanding that is important as we look to the larger social tolerance questions that we have for the program. So yes, poaching is a problem, but it's not the thing that's going to tank this program. Uh, yes, we've lost wolves in the past due to poaching. The vast majority of quote unquote poaching incidents occurred when the state of North Carolina opened up nighttime hunting of coyotes, um, which led to increased incidents of red wolf mortality. Um, we warned them of that. Fish and Wildlife Service warned them of that. And in fact, that was where the sort of our the, the beginning of the decade of litigation sort of started. And we're still sorting that thing out, still sorting through that. Uh, the good news is the states and the feds and groups like ours are finally coming back to the table. We're moving through this period of kind of, you know, embattled loggerhead type of scenarios and really working to move forward in a collaborative and structured uh uh, partnerships uh, to move things forward. And Heather's doing a great job leading those efforts for us on coexistence on the ground. And I'm very excited to see what the future brings as we continue to, to build community around support for this recovery effort and continue to empower each other, hold each other accountable, and really work with the communities um, to ensure that this program can be a success in North Carolina, because that is the main thing we need to demonstrate if we're ever going to see red wolves reintroduced to other areas of the country in their historic range. Uh, it's going to be very hard to ask, you know, Louisiana, Missouri, Arkansas, like, hey, we want to reintroduce wolves into the Ozarks or to, uh, you know, wherever. And they look and say, okay, well, 
how, how's this worked elsewhere? And they look at North Carolina and they see this amazing model for 30 years, a pretty nightmare scenario for the past five or 10. And now we're at kind of this new dawn. So we are, we are digging out of a hole, but we have never had more resources, more energy, more enthusiasm uh, for this recovery effort than we have right now. And that is evidenced by the number of people that are participating on this call today. So know that you are a part of this inertia that is helping move and propel this program forward that will generate success in North Carolina, which will then unfold to future recovery efforts across the region. And again, we're making that slow, steady march towards restoring America's Red Wolf. Sam asked a really interesting question about the minimum number of wild. So this is in the Q&A, so um, you guys can't see it. But Sam's question is, what is the minimum number of wild wolves required for a self-sustaining population? Um, that's a very interesting question. And <laughs> there is something called a population viability analysis that actually um, is a very large research study that is done on populations like these. Um, over time and and it really breaks down kind of your choke points for the population you know like when your population is at carrying capacity or when your population gets so low that you immediately bottleneck and lose all genetic diversity um i do not remember the numbers from the last pva but i i do know that the newest pva which is what the recovery plan is going to be relying on um should be out hopefully this year and it is going to uh, really dig into the number of wolves that are there, the genetic diversity of the wolves that are on the landscape. And then what exactly are we talking about numbers wise that that means this population can handle itself? Oh, we've got a great question Ooh, coming in yeah, about we, Yellowstone. <laughs> Heather, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I will. So I love Yellowstone. Who doesn't? Um, oh, you made the question just oh did it go away <laughs> yes you did um okay so i forget who asked it's it the I'm answered sorry. column because i am clicking on answered live but the okay. question heather is the yellowstone area economy benefits enormously from ecotourists who want to see wolves any possibilities of that with red wolf and that's from john john stillman thanks ben um you know, it's always been our hope, and I, I personally have even described this area of North Carolina as a potential mini Yellowstone in that it is such a unique and incredibly biodiverse region of our state that um, honestly no one, well, not no one, but a lot of people don't visit. Um, and we've been making efforts to encourage people to, to go to the recovery area, to go to the refuges and, um, you know, stop by the education center, see the wolves that are there, drive through um, the actual refuge. And, and, you know, unfortunately, as soon as everyone started going to see the wolves, we ended up with a big problem. And that big problem was acclimation. Um, and if you think about the way Yellowstone is set up, there are so many rangers and so many park service employees who are out there and they're managing wildlife interactions as best as they can. And they're doing it all year long. Um, and, and they have really specific rules about, you know, if there's a grizzly out, how far away do you have to be? And there's always a ranger there making sure that people aren't getting too close and such. Um, fact is, we just don't have that in, the refuge system in North Carolina, um, there's just not enough staff to, to make sure that's being done correctly. So unfortunately, Fish and Wildlife had to go through and implement a number of closures um, within the recovery area on the refuge this past year because they were seeing um, human desensitization and acclimation happening rapidly. Um, and honestly, you know, there were puppies out there and stuff. So it was just, it was a great time to be a wildlife photographer, but, you know, not such a great time to be a wolf who needs to stay wild. Um, this is going to be a challenge for us as we move forward, because we want to encourage ecotourism. We, we recognize that this community, some of these towns are really, they're not thriving. Um, and we want to see them thrive and we want to see thriving connected to the wildlife in the area, but it has to be done very thoughtfully, very conscientiously and very ethically. Um, and there's actually a lot of, you know, big concerns and questions about ecotourism 
and ethics and how that all plays a part. So I'm going to get on my soapbox and tell you guys that I'd love for you to go out there and patronize these businesses, visit the refuge, see the wildlife, but you have to do so respectfully. You, you absolutely cannot be 50 yards away from a wolf and just stand there. Um, and, and, I, and I think it, it hurts our hearts a little when we think about, oh, well, I'm going to drive out to the refuge and see this critically endangered red wolf and then shout at it and scream and make myself look big and scary and chase it away. But honestly, y'all, that's what you got to do. Um, and, and this is my request to any of you who goes out there. Do not play around with these wolves, with the bears. If you are too close to them, you need to move and you need to scare them because it's creating issues already. Um, and one big difference about the Yellowstone situation is that not nearly as many people live out there. And the people who do live out there, they're, they're used to the wildlife conflicts that they experience and they know how to handle them. Whereas on the other hand, unfortunately, what we see in the recovery area is people who are just not as accustomed to living alongside these animals, they, they get scared. And so it, it leads to wolf deaths. So um, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, that was great, Heather. I just want to say one thing. <laughs> I think it's an important comparison between Yellowstone and um, the recovery area, and that's really with the land management type as well. So national parks, if you know much about national park history, really has a strong bent towards the human experience in the outdoors, you know, providing an historical natural connection for people. Um, and so as an agency, they are set up to facilitate that. They have rangers, they have visitor centers, they have a huge amount of infrastructure that's about getting people in the great outdoors and connecting with these amazing American treasures. The refuge system um, was set aside specifically for the conservation of wildlife and biodiversity. So I say that simply to mean that our access to refuges is quite frankly a gift and uh, they will continue to be managed putting red wolves first. And it's wonderful to have a land base that is centric towards the wildlife's experience. And that is exactly why Fish and Wildlife Service is able to move quickly to provide closures, to move people. Uh, and Heather's absolutely right. There, there's just a lot that we have to now think about uh, when it comes to human behaviors interacting with these wild animals as they obviously have become higher profile, more gregarious. Um, but I do think that that is, um, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but at the end of the day, um, a landscape that is appreciated for being uh, a home to this amazing animal is one that can thrive economically, and it's one that can really be a source of pride for the community. Um, you know, and I, I realize I don't, I don't speak for the community. I would never put myself in that position, but I do know that when you look at just other levels of wildlife commerce and economy in those areas, whether it's or hunting and fishing, or wildlife viewing, or, you know, there's, it's such a wildlife rich area, that that really has to be a stable part of the economy. And I think red wolves are a critical part of that, because it is simply a place you can't experience that anywhere else in the world right now. So I think we're going to continue to, to always need to be at the crux of these complex and challenging issues. And as we as we're currently out of time, I just want to quickly say how much again, we appreciate your support, and your participation. And um, Tracy, do you want to give them some some final details on what they'll be seeing next? Yes. Yeah, I want to let folks know that we did record this webinar, um, hopefully by the end of the week, although it might be early next week, we'll be sending out a, an email to everybody who registered for the webinar, um, whether you attended or not, and it will include the list of action items you can take, our contact information, a link to this recording. It'll be on YouTube. We'll share that link with you and any other important information that we referenced in this webinar. Um, maybe a, a link to where the um, SSP zoos um, and nature centers are located so that you can go and visit the wolves. Um, so we'll be sending that information out within the week. And I want to thank uh, both Jesse and Greg so very, very much. Um, Greg attended our webinar last year and became a volunteer. 
um, afterwards and um, has helped plan these events along with Jesse. And we're just thrilled to um, have such wonderful volunteers. And uh, we encourage you all to get involved as well. Yeah, don't be shy. I'm seeing a lot of questions, a lot of stuff. You've got our content info. Uh, get a hold of us. We're, we're really enthusiastic and excited to engage with each and every one of you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming.